So for question one, group five says that when they come across a literary reference that they don't understand, they think that it's important to look it up and find out what's going on. Because if the play uses a reference, that means it's probably trying to add a different kind of meaning to this part. So if we don't understand the reference, we might not get that meaning. We would lose some part of the play. So we should find out what's going on, right? Thank you. Now, usually I would agree if a work of literature mentions another work of literature, you should probably find out something about that other work to at least get a sense of the meaning. But this play is a very unusual exception. When the poet Sandor recites poetry, Rachel does not understand. In the story, Sandor is talking with Rachel. So the fact that the person who hears the poetry does not understand is part of the story. So if we, the audience, also do not understand that reference, that puts us on the side of Rachel. Like we are also trying to figure out what Sandor is trying to say. If Sandor is a successful communicator, then we would not have to look up the poetry in order to understand what he is saying. If Sandor is not a successful communicator and Rachel and we are left confused. This is the design of the play. And so it, we can also think about why would the play give us a literature reference that the audience is not supposed to understand? What effect does that have on us as an audience? To tell the truth, um, on page 22, the poem that Sandor recites for Rachel is given at the bottom of the page. It's Henry Newbolt's Cities Drowned. I never heard of this poem before reading this play. Um, the second reference at the bottom of page 22, Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon is a nursery rhyme, Tong Yao. Um, the audience is expected to know this poem, and so there's no footnote to explain what it is. Uh, so between these two references, one that we don't understand and one that we are supposed to understand, Rachel understands neither of them. And so for the first one, we are with Rachel, but for the second one, we are with the poet. And in that difference, we can feel uh, the meaning of living in a society without uh, cultural tradition, how that feels like what we would lose without a cultural tradition. The other place with literary allusions is on page 24. There are also two references on page 24. The first one is in the middle of the page, uh, as group five mentioned. Sandor says, there's an old Norse legend. One day the moon will be eaten by a wolf and disappear, and that'll be the end of the world. I don't know this one either. But notice that Rachel doesn't ask questions. Her response to this is to ask him, how do you know things? And from this, we can infer that the reason Sandor mentions the Norse legend is not to try to teach Rachel, is not to pass on cultural knowledge. He's trying to impress her. It's just a guy trying to impress a girl. So if we didn't know about this Norse legend, uh, it wouldn't matter so much either. The point of this exchange is simply that he knows things that Rachel does not. The second reference is near the end of this same page. And again, uh, 
Sandor does not expect Rachel to engage with the poem. The poem is simply there uh, for him to show off for Rachel. So again, uh, on the on this page, these two examples, if we don't know about these references, we are still able to feel the effect of the play. Because when Sandor is mentioning these references, he's not communicating about them anyway. Although the, the last poem on page 24 is quite famous, uh, El Penseroso by John Milton. So yes, usually if you come across a literature reference, you should probably look it up. Um, but in this case, because uh, Rachel is not expected to know them anyway, it doesn't really matter too much. Does that make sense? OK, thank you, group five. Do other groups have thoughts or questions about this one? OK, uh, let's move on to question two, group one. Why does the play give Rachel a tardigrade? And how might that be related to the biologist's um, statement? So group one reminds us that a tardigrade is a tiny animal that can survive almost any kind of condition. Underwater, deep cold, deep uh, like hot places. Uh, tardigrades can even survive in outer space for limited times. It is an animal that on page 22, the biologist says at the top of page 22, it's an animal that can switch life on and off. And so the biologist gives a tardigrade to Rachel. So group one says that maybe uh, the biologist sees that Rachel needs this kind of skill to be able to switch her life on and off, to be able to survive in any kind of situation. Uh, because what's going on with Rachel in this play? As group one mentions, when she's on a date with Sandor on page 29, Sandor uh, takes her to like a field, I think. It's, it's a fake field, but uh, it looks like a real field and there are plants and grass and trees. They run around, but at the bottom of page 29, uh, Rachel says, uh, I'm not alive. There's something here that isn't in me. Ask for another girl. I'm sick. So it looks like Rachel is not able to deal with nature and space 
and the freedom to shout and run around. We mentioned last week that Rachel's life is very controlled, controlled in even the most detailed parts. So when she's given such freedom, she doesn't know how to handle it. And being unable to handle freedom presents itself in her body as a feeling of being sick. Kind of like um, when we're sitting in a moving car and our body cannot handle that kind of movement, we feel car sick. Um, and she says, there's something here that isn't in me. I'm not alive. So it seems like, according to Rachel herself, for most of her daily life, she's not alive. And when she's faced with something that is alive, she doesn't know how to handle it. So that connects with what the biologist says, right? Maybe Rachel needs an example of a uh, life form that can turn life on and off when it needs to. Uh, that maybe Rachel needs to learn how to deal with situations where she is not given uh, freedom and an inner life and to be able to deal with situations where she is given freedom and an inner life and introspection. Group one also mentioned the fact that Rachel is a sex worker. Her job is to a psychologically and physically accompany important men. Uh, and so like this line of work can often feel dehumanizing. The idea that the client sometimes will treat the worker as only a body instead of a person. So in the terms of this play, uh, where being alive means having an inner life, Rachel's line of work habitually deprives her of that inner life. Her work itself is killing her spiritually. Uh, she usually does not have to face that fact, but after meeting Sandor and listening to his poetry and like, seeing uh, an image of nature and freedom, she suddenly realizes that this is not in her. There's something here that is not in me. I don't have this in my inner life. And that's when she has to face the fact that her inner life is dead. She's not alive inside. In fact, the first moment that she sees the possibility of something more inside herself is on page 22. Sandor's first poem. Um, near the bottom of the page, Rachel says, must have been hardly anyone around. And then dreamily, this is a stage direction to the actor to deliver the next line like in a dream state. A world within me. So this is the part of the poem that Rachel focuses on that catches her attention. That there could be a world within a person, could be a world within herself. It's compared to the other thing that she focuses on, the idea of cities. She doesn't understand what a city is, so she asks. And so it's possible that she also does not understand what it means to have a world within me. This is an idea that she is not used to. Nobody has ever asked her to think about this. Nobody has ever valued this part of her. So from this moment on, her relationship with Sandor is not just about uh, keeping him happy physically and mentally, because it seems like what makes Sandor happy is trying to uh, give Rachel a clearer idea of what her life is really like. Sandor, maybe you can say, takes pleasure in educating her. So why does the play give Rachel a tardigrade? At this point, as a symbol, right? A symbol of how Rachel could successfully navigate her life now that she realizes that 
uh, she is not usually alive inside. But the tardigrade itself will later have a slightly bigger role to play. If you remember from the front of the play, the list of characters, one character is the on the list of characters. The second to last person is Sandor Voss slash Stetsky slash Tardigrade. So it seems like the Tardigrade will speak. Or maybe will appear on the stage uh, being acted by a person. So maybe that will become more important later. Thank you, group one. Do other groups want to add ideas or questions? OK, let's move on to group two. Your question is question three. In the play's future, the poets don't write their own poetry. Is, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing and why? <clears throat> so as we read the, the page 24 and we can see uh, the Sandor's parents intend to have Sandor to become a, a one to, to design games or something. And he said he, and because he lacks imagination, and then he became a poet. So I think that maybe in this period or in this time, in this environment, the imagination is not encouraged or popular or maybe imagination is not allowed to have because they can, maybe they'll make you feel like a real person or something. So the, the first thing comes to mind is that, but, but to me, I think that a poet, imagination is quite important to a poet because a poet always can see something, you know, just uh, apparently, you must see something inside and to find his real own feelings or to show his feeling to make people feel inspired or touched. So to a point, I would think that maybe the first thing is the imagination. But you know, it's a contrast. It's not encouraged for people to imagine it is time. So I think that maybe you tell us that the people's thought is clenched, it's not is controlled, not welcomed. You can express your own feelings or your own feelings must be suppressed. So let Mm, so I think there will be a bad things if you, the poet cannot just create their own ideas. And the second part from my team member is that, that it maybe is that uh, imagination is the thing to make our life better. For example, if people cannot imagine that they can fly in the sky, how can be the airplanes can be, can be invented? So imagination actually is a way to make people feel, to make people's life better, right? So when creation is no longer needed, maybe it means that it's time to decline, to, to you stop getting better. So I would think that the poet, if they cannot create their own poems, I think I would think that's a bad thing. Yeah, that's all. OK, thank you. Uh, I want to ask you a follow up question. Um, so in your answer, you mentioned that the only kind of creativity that this society allows is in designing games and that the society does not encourage or allow a personal creativity like in writing poems or making art. Uh, but then in the second part of your answer, you also mentioned inventions, technology. Do you think that technology and inventions require the same kind of creativity as poetry? Maybe to make a poetry can be something that it don't have, it doesn't have to be true, right? It just you are feeling or you are feeling to make people feel touched. But the creation of technology, like, I think there's a, a time or you have to put something into real. That's the difference between the creative or the technology or the, the invention and the imagination, right? It's a difference. 
Okay, thank you. So it looks like uh, a society that allows creative games probably also would still have technological inventions. It could keep functioning. The only kind of creativity it does not have is personal creativity related to uh, feelings and experience and like personal fantasy imagination. We also see later that uh, when Rachel uses the reactive to engage in a fantasy world, there are some problems as well. So this question therefore becomes, why is personal imagination based on experience and a personal creativity based on experience and imagination and feeling? Why is that important or is it not important? Let's take a short break.
Our discussion of question three has brought us to the idea that this question is really about the value, importance, or necessity, or not, of the kind of personal creativity related to experience, imagination, and feelings that are needed to write poetry. So I ask you once again, group two, why is this kind of creativity important or is it not important? <laughs> I was to stick to my point. I think creativity is, is really important, right? If you want to live uh, a better life or you want to make the future better, I think creative must be on the by us. <laughs> okay, thank you. So in order to make the future a better place, this kind of personal creativity is very important, says group two. Uh, and I think what you mean is that as societies change, as people change, uh, old creations, inventions, old systems may not still be suitable. And so in order to find a system or a way of doing things that truly fits the new situation. You have to be willing to explore yourself and your place in that situation. And that calls for deep personal explorations of feelings and experience and creativity. Uh, okay, that does make sense. I think another idea here is that um, there is something in the human mind that wants to be recognized. We want other people to see who we really are. We don't want everyone just to see us as a student or a son or daughter or a customer, but we want someone to really know us for being ourselves. That idea is a very personal idea and personal um, identity is based on experience and imagination. The, the kinds of experiences, the specific experience that a person has combined with how the person thinks about that experience. Both sides of identity are very personal. And so if in a society that does not allow for this kind of creativity, how is someone to really know that they have been seen, that they have been recognized? How do we satisfy that urge of feeling like our life means something more than simply being part of a bigger system? That there is something intrinsically valuable about ourselves as a specific person living in a specific period of time in a specific place. In a society that suppresses this kind of imagination, what it is really doing, as you've mentioned, is it is suppressing individuality. It is suppressing the idea of being a human person. It's turning people into parts of a machine. And that's also why in group one's discussion, I mentioned Th that they talked about Rachel's job as a sex worker. When she says at the bottom of page 20, 20, which page was it? Nine, I think. When she says at the bottom of page 29, ask for another girl. This implies that for the customer, for the client, sex workers are interchangeable. They're like cars. If you don't like this car, you can get another car. This way of looking at her job uh, completely erases the personal and individual aspect of human existence. And so if we remember last week, the first time we met Rachel, she was caught somewhere she's not supposed to be. And one of the first questions that the system asks her is, do you have employment? Do you have a job? So the system doesn't recognize individuals. It recognizes people based on their work, 
based on the part of the world they live in, but not as specific people. This seems to be the uh, dominant value system of this future society. Thank you. Do you guys want to or other groups want to add ideas or questions about this one? OK, let's move on to group three. Your question, why do you think in this future world theater disappeared before poetry?
Okay, group th three has some very interesting ideas. Um, so, why did theater disappear first? Um, one answer to this is that in the evolution of literature, poetry came first, and then we had theater. Uh, if you think about Western literature first, we had Homer, and then we had Greek tragedy. Um, so if in this society literature is degrading and people are losing interest in literature are losing access to literature, it makes more sense to think that the most original and basic forms of literature would last longer. Uh, another part of this answer, according to group three, is that in this society, it, uh, this society only cares about things that it can use. Uh, group two mentioned that like, creativity in the design of games and technology. So if the poets in this society still have access to some poems, we can safely assume that these poems might be useful in some way. And group three uh, says that maybe the use of this poetry is in preserving information. So, for example, when Rachel asks Sandor about the moon, Sandor can rattle off a few poems uh, to describe the moon, to uh, describe how people used to think about the moon. Or, uh, for example, the, like the Norse legend about the moon being eaten by a wolf. We can look at these works of literature as a kind of history. But at the same time, there are some kinds of literature that are not made available. If we look at the bottom of page 25, scene 15. Uh, six lines from the bottom. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. In the middle, now. Thanks to careful lobbying of the authorities, the plays of William Shakespeare are accessible again, reclassified under poetry. So this tells us something. Uh, Sandor says that he had to carefully convince the authorities to release the works of Shakespeare. So this tells us that some literature is available, but other literature is not. Uh, and when I ask group three why, group three says, well, maybe the unavailable literature is considered too dangerous. Maybe it might have too much information, might lead people to be less controllable. I think another way to say this is that maybe that kind of literature would uh, be more able to get people to think about their lives and realize how little life they actually have. That also is a kind of information. The second interesting thing about this is related to my question. They had to reclassify Shakespeare as poetry in order to gain access to his work. So why is theater? It looks like theater, when it says theater disappeared, it looks like it doesn't mean uh, people forgot it. It seems like it means theater was locked away. And so this question becomes, why was theater locked away? Uh, and group three, again, keeping with their answer, say that theater might have more information. Uh, it, so in some sense, it could be more powerful. Poetry is just words. Theater is people putting on costumes and makeup, performing those words. So there's more information there already. It's not just what you feel or think when you read the words, but you're actually looking at real people putting on situations physically in real space. Have you ever seen a play live? OK, how about this? Have you ever seen a concert live, like a musician? Does that feel different from listening to their CD? It does, right? Why? Why does it feel different? You feel alive, yes, because it's real people, the real musician on the stage, the real fellow fans surrounding you, 
the difference between listening on a CD and listening in a concert is people, which is the same difference between reading a poem and watching a performance of a play. People. If you ever have a chance to watch a play and it's a good play, right? Not like a, a, a shitty play, but it's a good play, then the emotions from the actors will be in the room with you. Like, I'm sure you've all had the experience. You walk into a room and two people are arguing. You immediately feel that emotion in the air. The same with the play. In a play that you're watching, when the characters start arguing or they fall in love or something emotional happens, you also feel that as part of the audience. So theater in many ways can be much more powerful than simply reading something on your phone alone. So that might be one reason why theater was closed off first. And by reclassifying Shakespeare as poetry instead of theater, the authorities are essentially saying you can read Shakespeare, but you can't perform Shakespeare. And we all know that Shakespeare is not the easiest um, poet to read. If you see two actors performing Shakespeare on stage, even if you can't understand them, you can understand their emotions, their relationships. But if it's just words on the paper, it's not as powerful. And that might be why theater disappeared first. Thank you. Do you guys uh, have ideas or questions you want to add? Other groups? OK, so moving on to question five, group four. What is the reactive? Why is it opposed to the idea of being alive? And do you think that this opposition makes sense? So group four thinks that this comparison does not make sense. First of all, let's figure out what a reactive is on page 32. Um, you'll see that I drew a line on the left side of the page. So let's start with uh, Rachel. None of it's real, auditor. It's a reactive auditor. Exactly. It's a program. It knows what interests you. It learns. It tries variations until it gets a response from you. Rachel, every reactive auditor. Why else is 95% of the population goggled in? 
So from this uh, dialogue, it seems like a react a reactive is something that you put over your eyes and it brings you into like a, a fantasy world. Maybe a computer program controls what you see and it always tries to find something that will get a response from you. So like you can think of it as an immersive video game or like a fantasy computer simulation world. Now the play seems to be saying that uh, this is the opposite of being alive. If you remember, Rachel said, I'm not alive. Um, and we know that most of her free time is spent using the reactive. So if you put these two together, it seems to be saying that using the reactive is not real life. But group four thinks that this way of putting it does not make sense. A reactive is simply a piece of technology that controls what you see and what you perceive. But being alive is about a person's inner space, inner life, whether you are truly in tune with what's going on in the world, whether you truly feel the feelings that you uh, you want to feel and that are not um, mandated of you. In other words, you can feel alive when you're running through nature. You can also feel alive when you're playing video games. Uh, according to group four, these two are not the same thing. And you know what? I kind of agree. I think that's right. Um, a lot of the time people will say like, uh, especially older people, sorry, uh, will say like, stop using the computer, stop watching TV, go outside and experience life. But really today, a lot of our life is spent online. Online is also a part of life. Uh, the experiences are different, but they are still experiences. They are still part of our inner life. Uh, another thing some people might say is like, uh, video games are fake. If you like racing cars, why don't you go race a real car? Uh, and this kind of idea does not understand the fact that these like playing a race car game and racing a real car are two entirely different experiences and that each experience can be valuable for itself. The race car game is not a fake version of driving a race car. It's a game and humans have been playing games since before history. So the play seems to be using the reactive as a kind of symbol for not feeling your own real feelings, not having an inner life. But according to group four, and I agree, this result is only because of the way that the reactive is used, not because of the technology itself. Um, we can use a, an example from um, our lives. I'm sure you've played that kind of game before. At first, it's pretty fun, but it gets harder and harder, and you have to spend more and more time in order to keep going. And eventually, it feels like something you have to do every day, not something that you want to do, but if you don't play that day, then you lose your progress or something like that. Think about games where you have to gain experience or where you have to join a daily activity or you have to join at a certain time during the day in order to meet your friends. In that case, the game that you're playing no longer feels fun. It feels like an obligation, feels like a chore, something you have to do every day and tick off your list. So we see that a game can be used in different ways as entertainment or as a way to get you hooked in order to get you to spend more time. The same thing can be said of the reactive. You can use it sparingly and like help you recharge energy after a long day at work, or you might use it to escape the problems in your life instead of trying to face those problems and solve those problems. You might use it creatively to explore your own interests and what makes you feel feelings and happy and joy and excitement. Or you might use it simply to follow the latest trends and see what other people are doing and see what like the 
video game companies are selling what is so-called popular uh, these days. There are different ways of using technology. The problem is not the technology itself. So this simple opposition does not seem to make a lot of sense. Thank you, group four. Other groups, do you want to add ideas or questions to this one? OK, so before class next week, please finish the play. Um, next week, we will also talk about the midterm exam. And I will explain how to do the exam. I will show you the questions and I will give you some tips on how to get a high score. So I'm sure you will not want to miss that. Let's go back to page 20 and look at today's selection in more detail. This should be page 20, right? Yes, it's page 20. Scene 13. Behind a scrim or a screen, two women burn a poem. As the flame dies down, Rachel and Sandor enter in darkness. So this is a very interesting way to transition between two scenes. If you remember, the end of scene 12, um, the Stetsky and Kors come in and they take most of Akhmatova's important books. They terrorize her. So scene 12 is about Anna and Lily. And we already know that what they really do is Anna writes poems, hands them to Lily, Lily memorizes those poems, and then Anna burns the poem to leave no evidence. So in order to transition between the past and the future, they have the play has Anna and Lily burning a poem to provide light uh, as a kind of transition. And so there will be a moment during this transition where four people will be on stage. Two women burning a poem behind a screen and Rachel and Sandor who enter in darkness. Rachel facing upstage, which means away from the audience. She's looking uh, in the direction of the stage away from the audience. So like on a stage, the directions are, for example, I'm on stage right now. So if this is a stage, this is downstage, this is upstage, this is stage left, and this is stage right. It's from the direction of the actor. So she faces away from the audience, replaces her dress as the lights come up, which means that she just finishes putting on her dress as the lights come up. Uh, so before this scene begins, she was not wearing her dress. Like in the story. The next line says, Sandor reclines on pillows, shoes off, chest bare, watching her. So Sandor is lying down on pillows. He's not wearing a lot of clothing. So what happened in the story just before scene 13? Rachel wasn't wearing a dress. Sandor is not wearing a lot of clothes and he's lying down. Seems like they just had sex, right? Uh, Rachel is a sex worker and she has just done uh, a key part of her job. Ms. enters with a jug of wine and two glasses. She casts an appraising glance at Rachel. Appraising means of evaluating. She's evaluating Rachel. Ms. says to Sandor, I trust everything meets with your approval. So from this line, we get the sense that Ms. is maybe Rachel's supervisor, her boss. Ms. is the person who's in charge of 
giving Rachel a job and making sure that she does the job well. And this fits with the name of the character, Ms. Uh, this is the same way that you pronounce that you pronounce this title. Uh, in the lower left hand corner. We know that if a woman is unmarried, you would call her Miss. If a woman is married, you would call her Mrs. But if you don't want to say whether a woman is married or not, you would write this, M-S dot, and you pronounce this, Ms. Not Miss, which is single, Ms. So in the world of this play, this character, Ms, is the only person with a title. The only person we would call not by their name, but by a title of Ms, which means that this person has some power. Right, we don't say Mr. Sandor, we don't say Miss Rachel, but we call this character Ms. So that her name already tells us that she is in charge. Uh, so she is responsible for making sure that Rachel does her job well. Sandor says, absolutely. Rachel gives him a dazzling smile. Ms. puts the wine down. Ms. Rachel is without question our most popular girl. If you have any problems, Sandor, no, no, everything's fine. Ms. All of our girls are highly trained professionals. Mr. Voss, perfect in every way. So Ms. also calls him Mr. Mr. Voss. It's a business relationship to her. Uh, and she says that all of her workers, all of her girls are perfect in every way. If there is anything not to your liking, please let me know. These two sentences are very scary. All of the girls are perfect in every way, and if you find that your girl is not perfect, please let me know. What do you think would happen to a girl who a client says is not perfect? Maybe she might get uh, worse clients. Maybe she might lose her job. And in a society that cares whether people have jobs, if she loses her job, it would be the same as losing her life. Society would not recognize her. She would not be able to fit into that system. So these two lines tell us that in order for a person to exist in this society, they have to be perfect, or at least for a sex worker, they have to do everything perfectly. One mistake, and if the client tells Ms, then the girl would suffer serious consequences. It's not a, today we call this a precarious job, Ling Wei de Gongzuo. One small mistake could have big consequences. It's kind of like if you are an Uber Eats driver today. Like if you make a delivery a few minutes too late, you would get a lower score and you would get fewer uh, orders and you would make less money. That kind of thing. Or if you drive an Uber like to d deliver people and your customers keep giving you four stars in instead of five stars you would get less business and eventually you might get no business. She exits a silence. So there is a, a period where the characters on stage do not talk. Silence is one of the most important parts of a play. A silence is never empty. It is always filled with some atmosphere or feeling or unspoken ideas. In this case, the silence seems to emphasize how easy it is for Rachel to lose her job. 
Min says, if there's anything not to your liking, please let me know. And she leaves. And the audience is left to think about that idea before the next thing happens. The next thing is uh, Rachel pours wine, hands a glass to Sandor, sits next to him. And then she says, is this your first visit to Earth? So she's making small talk. Notice that it says a silence and then she pours the wine. So there is a period of time on stage where Rachel and Sandor don't actually do anything. They're just staying in place, letting the silence take up the stage. Uh, if the play wanted Rachel to pour the wine while she talks, the play would say, Rachel pours the wine, blah, 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 as she says. And then the next line, is this your first visit to Earth? But the play very deliberately separates these two parts. First, a silence, then a motion, and then she speaks. Sandor, no, I've been coming here since I was a child. My parents thought it would help me appreciate how lucky I am. Rachel, I've never been on a space station. So they're currently on Earth. Sandor, never? Rachel, I've only ever traveled virtually using the Raktiv. By the way, the name Raktiv is also a cool name because it's it's reactive. Right, as a beidong, not a dong. Someone who wears it is reacting to whatever fantasy that they see. So it's a symbolic name, but it's not a practical name. If you saw a product called the Ractive, would you want to buy it? Probably not. It's not even easy to say because we're so used to saying the word reactive. Uh, so it's a symbolic name. Anyway, I've only ever traveled virtually, but I'm going to one day. I'm determined. So this at this point in the play, this seems to be Rachel's main goal in life to travel to in space. Sandor. Um, there's also like a kind of critique of travel as well. Like if if your main goal in life is to travel to a specific place. Usually that means that you uh, don't have bigger goals. If your only goal is to move your body from one place to another, um, either you are very happy or you don't care about a lot of other things. In this case, uh, we know that Rachel is very limited in her life. So it's not that she doesn't care about other things. She doesn't know that there are other things to care about. Sandor, my family makes wine. He lifts the glass to his nose, grimacing. To grimace means to make an ugly face. Here it's probably because the wine does not smell good. So to grimace is like you smelled something bad, you ate something bad. That kind of face. Not a bouquet I've encountered before. A bouquet originally means a group of flowers that like you would give to someone. But here the word bouquet describes the smell of a wine. If you ever smell wine, wine doesn't have just one smell. You can smell many different kinds of smells in a single wine. So the collection of all of those smells is called a bouquet. So he smells the wine, doesn't smell good. He says, I've never smelled this before. Rachel, it's made from plankton. Hides all. Uh, plankton is the smallest kind of sea um, plant. So it's not made from grapes. It's made from sea plants. And this tells us that maybe this world either doesn't have grapes or 
grapes are very valuable and ordinary people do not have access to grapes. The one thing that ordinary people do have access to is plankton, which is something that today it, we do not think is valuable enough to eat. Usually plankton is eaten by fish. And that tells us something about the state of nature in this future world. Nature, the natural world, has degraded so much that they don't even have grapes. They have to eat things made out of sea plants. And so she says it's made from plankton. He hands her the glass without tasting it. So this fact makes him not want to drink the wine. Sandor, we make ours from real grapes. My people originally came from the Barossa Valley. We supplied the entire top rank. Aha, so wine made from real grapes goes to the top people, most important or richest people. Uh, and he says Barossa Valley. I'm not sure whether this is a real valley, but it's important to know that the best grapes are grown in valleys. Uh, because grapes taste the best in a dry environment. Most fruit tastes the best in a dry environment. That's why like one of the most famous kinds of watermelon is from Xinjiang. The desert, very dry. When a fruit grows in the desert, it conserves sugar. It conserves um, energy in the form of sugar. So when we eat it, it has a stronger taste. OK, uh, we supply the entire top rank. Rachel, Ms says you come from a very important family. Sorry about this. I, it's if you see the original paper, it's very hard to photograph. Uh, so Ms says you come from a very important family. Sandor surveying the room, which means he looks around the room. You've no idea. At home on the space station, there's green vineyards to walk through. There's a small pause here between green and vineyard. Probably because he's thinking that the word vineyard is not exactly the word that he wants. A vineyard is simply where a place where you grow grapes. But this hesitation tells us that there's a difference between vineyards on Earth and vineyards in space. Uh, or more specifically, there's a difference between the pure idea of vineyards or the stereotype of vineyards and what vineyards actually look like on a space station. So that's why he kind of hesitates to say this word. It does not exactly fit with the usual idea of a vineyard, but it is a vineyard. It's a place to grow grapes. Along the axis, there's zero gravity. This tells us the shape of the space station. Axis, axis is the center part that the other parts spin around. In Chinese, so this tells us that the space station is built in a spinning uh, situation around a center. And therefore, the center has no gravity. You guys know how to create artificial gravity, right? You have to use centrifugal force. So if the center has no centrifugal force, you won't feel gravity. As a child, I used to strap on wings and fly. So this tells us that, first of all, he had a childhood without having to work. There was a period of his life that was not strictly controlled. Uh, and this fits with the idea that he is from the upper class, that maybe his family is part of the society that controls other people instead of being controlled by other people. And the second thing this tells us is that he has a sense of adventure and exploration 
that he wants to find out about things. He's curious. Maybe he even has some imagination. Rachel, tell me more about up there. Sandor, on a space station? You must have heard about it from hundreds of people. Rachel, not from a poet. So this is where we find out that Sandor is a poet. And this fits with the idea that he would make wings and fly around as a child. It also fits with the idea that his family would make wine. Wine and poetry often go together. Sandor, I'm on the outer belt, so we see Earth through a kind of haze. So this tells us that there's more than one space station out there and that Sandor lives on a space station that's farther away from the Earth. Right, it's the outer belt. A uh, belt in Chinese is Dai. It's a kind of spatial arrangement. It's not an actual belt. Uh, so he can't see Earth very clearly. It's through a haze. It's fuzzy. It's blurry. But the stars are all visible. And again, this fits with our idea of what a poet is. Someone who drinks wine, uh, goes around having adventures, and looks at the stars. Rachel, I've never seen them. Uh, we know that Rachel's life is very closely controlled. Earth is divided, or at least Australia is divided into different sections, and that she usually works indoors. So it makes sense that she would not have seen the stars. She doesn't have the time or the freedom to do something so useless as to look at stars. Sandor, no, suppose you wouldn't have. Uh, he said he means I suppose you wouldn't have. Rachel, how do you find your way home through millions of space stations? So humanity now has millions of space stations. Sandor, same way you find your room, except it's a homing device on a shuttle. This line, so when Rachel says there are millions of space stations, the audience immediately gets a very fantastical, like uh, wonderful imagination of humanity spread out throughout the stars, taking over outer space. But the next line kills that romanticism. Uh, he finds his way the same way Rachel finds her room. So just like space in Australia is organized so that Rachel only has to follow the yellow line, doesn't have to think about where she is. In space, if you want to go somewhere, you sim the shuttle or the, the spaceship will set a course and go directly there, and you don't have to think about anything else. So this is a vision of space that is no longer free and open. This is a vision of space that has been controlled and organized. It's no longer a frontier. Okay, let's stop here.